want to welcome you all this morning. Good to see Wayne this morning. Good to see uh, actually quite a few of you that were here yesterday at the uh, at the uh, barbecue. 30, uh, 32, including uh, let's see, I'm trying to remember uh, two two who usually don't. Uh, don't show up. In fact, I'm, I met Alyssa for the first time, so that was that was cool. Billy Jack and Billy Jack. That's right. Well, he's yeah, that's true. He was actually he's been here before, but he's been gone for a year and a half. So yeah, you're right. Very good. So that was fun. It was a fun. It was good time, and uh, it's kind of like I feel like uh, what. Nathan Hale, I regret that I have only but one stomach to give for all the chili that was provided. But, uh, by the time I had one, it was like, oh, I'm full. I shouldn't have even taken so much. But It's a good problem to have. Well, we are in 1 Peter chapter 4, and we are in the next section. And uh, you'll be, I'll, I'll just say, you'll be happy to know that it's uh, a little more smiley-faced. <laughs> We've been in uh, the previous section all the way back in chapter 3, verse 13, and following all kind of introduced us and moved us in a direction of uh, preparation for suffering. But don't be, uh, don't be um, uh, put aside by saying this is a totally different subject. He actually is continuing in a positive uh, portion now, as opposed to, uh, obviously, when you're talking about people treating you in a mean manner, I mean, uh, that's fun, not really, it's not fun to have it happen and not fun to talk about it. So now we're talking about, we get down to uh, dealing, well the first part is, is with God, but then he gets down to dealing with us. And that's important if you think about your, um, your preparation for where we're going to go uh, as the body of Christ. And uh, the number of people in our past, uh, present, recent past, uh, this uh, last century past, and then the previous centuries past. And this is the, uh, is it this Sunday, last Sunday, when uh, Martin Luther nailed his 95 uh, theses on the, on the wall at, at Worms or Wittenberg? Wittenberg. Wittenberg, okay. And... Uh, I mean, he was, if they could have, man, if they could have got away with it, man, they would have taken him and burned him so quick, but they could never quite get there. And then uh, between uh, the resurrection of Jesus, the ascension of Jesus, and uh, 1517, I mean, just a whole lot of, of um, uh, putting your faith where your mouth is, where your hands are, where your feet go, and if you do, the possibility that you'll pay the price. So uh, if, if the church is the church, uh, that is to say, if, if the body of Christ is indeed the body of Christ, then we kind of need to look to our left and right and kind of see uh, not who is there, but uh, what brother or sister is, is standing next to us. So it, it, it's the, the body effect and how... Um, our relationship with uh, him affects, of course, uh, us, and then how our relationship with others affect the, the power and the presence of the church. So that's where we're going to go this morning. Let's commit our way to him in prayer. Father, this is your time. We're your people. This is your word. So speak to us by your spirit. Uh, we need it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So the very first thing out the gate, we get this phrase, uh, now the end of all things is at hand. So you, you see that, and for me what comes to mind is either in the movies, the cartoons, or the books, you know, the prophet looking guy, he wears a robe and he has a beard and long hair and he's carrying a sign, the end is near. I mean, when you read that, isn't that what comes to your mind? I don't know. It comes to my mind. So uh, the end of all things is at hand. And keep in mind that even though what we're dealing with here in verse 7 through 11 is, is positive, uh, looking back into the congregation rather than in a sense looking out there, we still connect the dots. 
And if you remember back in verse 5, uh, Peter had said, they, referring to the ones who um, uh, are surprised that you don't still run in your sinful ways, shall give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and dead. So we have fresh in our minds that Jesus is enthroned and he's, he's ready, he's prepared to pass judgment through his blood <coughs> upon his people and upon those who are not his people. So we have that in mind and with that we get then to verse 7 where he says the Telos, the end of all, has come near, is near, and, you know, is at hand works, has come near, and because it's the perfect tense, uh, the linear tense, it, it has come near, and because it has, it's been on this journey since the ascension of Jesus, he said, I'm coming back, I'm coming back, and Peter, in, uh, we'll just say 66 A.D., just to give us a point of reference, uh, Jesus said that, obviously, about 30 years, um, 33 years, however you want to count it, up until, G uh, up until uh, Peter is saying this, he says, uh, the, the end of all things, the telos, the completion, ha has come near, is near. So Peter, in 66, possibly, not necessarily, I don't think Peter was in prison, but the potential for him where, where he was writing this was any day he could, he could be taken. Uh, the potential, therefore, for his demise, uh, physical demise, his uh, execution, was, was a reality. But... Apart from that, he, he recognized that Jesus could return at any point. And so he says, the, the telos, the end, and I'll explain that in a moment, um, has come near, is near. It's like, we may not finish this sermon near. I may not finish this letter near. And it, it's, from that standpoint, it's, it's fascinating. And I suppose some, um, and I'll, you know, I don't use derogatory terms too much, but some nitwit might say, well, Peter was a false prophet because obviously this is 2,000 years later. And it's like, yeah. And the nearness of the conclusion has always been near. The return of Christ is always imminent. He could return before the end of the sermon. And, and as we finish uh, one event in one day and one week and one month, and some of us were once 50 years old, some of us haven't reached that yet, I realize, but okay, I'll say 16, because that's safe. Some of us were once 16, uh, and now we're way past that. Well, you know, every year Jesus could have returned, and he could return today. The imminence of Christ is always near. And I, I'm of the opinion, based upon world events, based upon where Israel's at, based upon where Russia's at, based upon where China's at, based upon where certain moral issues are at, that today is closer than we've ever been before, not just because of time, but because of the nature of things. But let's deal with this word, the end. Because when we, when we hear that, we think in terms of cessation. It's kind of like it's all coming to an, to an end. It, just, it hits the wall and explodes and there's nothing left. But the end, the word telos, has the concept built into it of, of the, the conclusion of a goal. The uh, uh, conclusion rather than the cessation. So we, we want to um, think in terms of God's plan moving forward and reaching its conclusion. Does that make better sense than, you know, it's all, we're all just going to hit the wall one day and it's all going to be done. Well, in a sense that's true, but God has a plan 
and we're part of it. And he keeps moving his plan inexorably down the road, and we keep moving within that plan. And at one point, the, uh, um, the point's going to be reached where we fulfill in verse 5, uh, where Jesus is ready to judge the living and dead. And it's going to happen. It's going to be done. It's going to be uh, that part. The, con the goal has been reached. The conclusion has been reached. So we look at then verse 7, and we read it in the English as the end of all things is at hand. Um, but if we read it a little bit as it's meant to be, the goal will have been reached and is, is like right at the door. And we are supposed to live that way. And part of that is the encouragement that goes back into the previous portions from chapter 3, verse 13, on through where we finished uh, last week in chapter 4, verse 6, where the outside pressures are great and we're supposed to have this attitude that is constantly looking at Jesus in all of that to respond with grace rather than with, you know, fist against fist. And... Uh, recognize that we keep moving within God's path for us. And so he tells us then how to do that in verse 7 where he says, um, Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled, or be of sound mind and be sober. And, and then he'll tell us why in a moment. But we deal with these first. Be of sound mind. Both of these are, are imperatives. So do this, and with that, do this. And the sound mind is um, that which um, Paul would have described in, in Titus as <clears throat> soundness of mind, balance in thought and disposition, um, not flighty, not unbalanced, and carried away by uh, uh, either silly notions or in uh, responding to the attacks of men. So being of sound mind means that as these uh, nasties are coming down the road, we keep looking at them, recognizing that God has a plan. And it's the <clears throat> same kind of plan that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego gave to Nebuchadnezzar. It's like, we're not, we're not abdicating to some other ruler. King Jesus is our king. And uh, we will not bow down to your pressures, your concepts, your threats. And even if you kill us, we will still not bow down. That's the sound mind. As we as believers recognize what God has said in here to us by way of promise, by way of revealed plan, by way of, of himself having revealed himself to us so we know who he is trustworthy, and uh, intelligent to the place where his plan is perfect. We recognize his sovereignty. We recognize the fact that none of those raging bulls, so to speak, that are heading in our direction, none of those threats are going to hit us without his permission. We are surrounded behind and be, uh, before and behind uh, by his loving arms. And so our soundness of mind... Uh, keeps us on the path and by way of encouragement to continue putting one, one foot in front of the other. When it says be sober, um, we've covered that before, uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 13, um, where it, it has its, its uh, uh, beginning in, in sobriety, not being drunk, but it's also uh, from the standpoint of, of being vigilant and circumspect. Um, and it's, it parallels, it's a twin to sober-minded, or uh, sound-minded. So he, uh, he says, in connection with the fact that the goal is going to be reached here, it's, 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 it's near. Uh, it could happen today, might happen tomorrow, we don't know. But uh, be of sound mind. Look at things appropriately. Uh, don't look at these threats as uh, something that has surprised God. God woke up this morning and said, Oh, 
<laughs> it's heading to them. What am I going to do? <laughs> Remember, God never slumbers or sleeps. Uh, nothing takes him by surprise. So we're of sound mind and we're sober. And he says, and this is something I, I haven't said yet, but in each of these verses is one of those words that I've said Peter has a lot of in his book. And it's in each of these verses, and it's the uh, word into, or uh, E-I-S in the Greek. And uh, we translate it variously to, unto, into, for, um, sometimes because. Uh, and so I've told you about that because it always seems that Peter is, is in motion. And this into is, is one of his words that his very... Uh, popular, it's in his brain that there's this movement of action. And so we are to remember the, uh, the conclusion of all things, the goal of all things it has drawn near, and therefore we are sand mind, we are sober, unto or into or for the purpose of prayer or prayers. The common word for uh, praying, and we understand that. We don't need a lot of description on prayer. Until we, we recognize that sometimes the, the, the word prayers isn't just a matter of, okay, but sometimes has to do with the concept of worship. And worship is so much more than praying, than singing, than any one thing. It, it's kind of the collection of, of, of it all. Um, when we take a situation and we look at it and say, that bull is running right at me. Lord, you know. Shall I, I mean, do I have the ability to move out of the way? Or do I stand there and point at it and say, move? I, what, is, what is your will? I mean, that worships him. Yeah, it's prayer, but you're connecting the dots into your life and, and recognizing that God has a, has a part and a place in it. God, what shall I do? What, what would honor you right now? So, as we then move into this section of very positive relationship of the church, verses 7 through 11 of chapter 4 of, of 1 Peter, Right out the gate, Peter is drawing our attention to God's plan, God's overall plan in our lives. And yeah, we've just covered in, in chapter 3, 13 through chapter 4, verse 6, about the, the persecution potential, uh, which is always, especially for these people, but how much different for those in our world today, the potential for suffering for Christ's sake. Even while you're doing good, even while you're a zealot, uh, chapter 3, verse 14, a zealot of what is good, and they still beat you up for it. It's like, well, Lord, <clears throat> you know who I am, you know where I am, you know what I'm about, and I know that you're in charge, so make this be used for your glory. And... Uh, you can take, I mean, the, the phrase for in our culture is if God gives you eggs, make an omelet, or, you know, if, you give, if it gives you lemons, make it's lemon. Spiritual truth. God remains the one who is in charge. And uh, I hate to say that these people in Northern California are confronted with the sovereignty of God. Um, and the stories, I don't know who it was, somebody yesterday shared that... Uh, the only apartment left standing in the, uh, in, in the community was their apartment or their cousin's apartment or sister. I can't remember who, who shared it. So, um, and, and you say, why? Were they better people? Who knows? That's where you look into the face of God and say, uh, obviously you have a plan for us because here we are right in the center of all this. What would you have us do? And yet we know that there's going to be brothers and sisters who come back and all that's left is the foundation and say, all right, Lord, you're in charge. What would you have us to do? And this tells us here that your sound mind, 
your sober spirit, uh, you're looking at it in, in prayer, to, to pray, so that you can pray, so that God remains sovereign and recognized as the, the king of your life. So verse 7 is a, is a powerful, powerful verse, and it connects the congregation back to their source, back to God. <clears throat> so we move into verse 2, where the, uh, the first word is, is interesting. It's, it's, well, pra, P-R-O, but it's not the omega, so it's not long O. Anyway, don't worry about that. It, it's like, woohoo! Oh, it's pra, not pro. Whoa. Um, it can mean above, so above all, or can mean before, so in, in order of importance. This is in this is first, or, or therefore preferential. And so after we recognize our connection with God in prayer. We, Peter is reminding the congregation as they look left and right now, before all things, before all things, regarding yourselves. So we're, we're, going, we're going to the congregation. Now what Peter has done right here with the verbiage is in a sense to close the door and then just look at each person and have each person look at each person. So we're looking at each other. That's what this verse is going to do. So this isn't the, the preacher preaching at you. This isn't the Sunday school teacher teaching you, the elder, you know, saying, look at this verse. This is God telling each of us to look at each other. So he says... Above all, <clears throat> as it relates unto yourselves, love, having love fully exerted into each other, toward each other, for each other. This love it is something that, uh, <clears throat> if you remember here at the church, um, if you haven't heard me say it in a while, we keep Jesus Christ in the center. This church is not about the pastor. It's not about an individual. It's not about the building. It's not about us. It's place on the road. This, this uh, body of believers is all about Jesus Christ. And if it's about anything else, then go somewhere else where it is. Sadly, there's too many churches where Jesus is like number 10 on a list of Six, and it's about the building, or it's about the pastor, or it's about the music, or it's about the programs. But here, we will make every effort to constantly keep it about Jesus Christ in the center, first and foremost. Secondly, we love one another here. And we've come across various verses over a period of time that draw attention to that. And this is one of those. And it's so clear that you could almost paint a picture of it. Almost. But this love is that which involves the intellect. It, it, it's what you would call a choice. And it involves looking at the subject and the response of connecting with that subject is no matter what, that which we'll, we'll define as love, giving to a person on the basis of what they need and not what they deserve, is going to be given in spite of anything else. And this is tested out in a variety of ways. It really is. Uh, and I, I did this at one church. I don't think I've done it here, but I'll do it this morning because as soon as I say what I'm going to say... Um, you're going to be tempted to either jump ship or jump on board the ship. When I say the word Trump, the response of people, well, there, there's two. It's either a thumb up 
or it's a thumb down with vitriol. Because I don't think there's, um, I mean, I've heard people say I'm not a fan of Trump, and it's like, what does that mean? So as soon as you say something, and, and I could have chosen something else, but politically speaking, that seems to be the hot potato. So you, you say that, and somebody says, I'm a Trump fan, and you turn and walk away because I'm not a Trump fan. I have vitriol toward the guy. Or somebody says, I hate Trump. And you turn and walk away because you say, if Trump is, if I could, he's with my neighbor, he'd be my best friend. Well, what this verse is saying is both of those responses are unacceptable. Above all, and the uh, New American Standard is keep fervent in your love. Fervent in your love, uh, uh, fervent, let's see, deeply in the NIV, neither one of those quite get to what the word is. It's fully exerted. And you're going to say, fully exerted, never heard of that. Well, that's because we read it in the English and we get used to those. So fully exerted is uh, intense, earnest, fervent, stretched out, pull, uh, put to full strain, exerted to the limit of its strength. So your love toward others is that rubber band that's stretched all the way out to where you can see it's turning white and it still hasn't snapped. So you love that much. That's what this is saying. Whether you're a fan of green or a fan of blue or a fan of this or a fan of that and someone doesn't enter into that, that's no reason for uh, disassociating disfellowshipping. In fact, there's very few reasons for uh, <laughs> disfellowshipping. There's lots of religions that, uh, man, if you don't believe the way they do, you're either, and if not that, physically, then you're kicked out. You're, you're blackballed, blacklisted, and it's, and it's sad. So what this verse is saying is, before all things. All right, so we've covered God. We're, we live in such a manner that he's our God, and now we bring it down to us. And we stand in a big circle and we look at each other. And you say, well, he's a Cubs fan and I'm a Dodgers fan. And never the two shall meet. <laughs> You're going to leave the church because of that? <laughs> Seriously? Okay, I just, the rubber just hit the road, didn't it? <laughs> You've gone from preaching to meddling. Yeah. <laughs> Well, then I've made my point, haven't I? I've made my point. <laughs> um, you are fully extended in your love for yourselves, unto yourselves. And Peter has gone from this ethereal out to everybody in the world down to us. And we look at each other. And we have no excuses before God, or really even before one another. And I find it, um, and I have to be real careful, um, <laughs> that I, I can be disappointed. I can be disappointed. I can be disappointed. Um, somebody s says something they did, and I, I disapprove in my spirit. I'm wondering, is this the time for me to correct them, or is it something that they're going to have to work out on their own? Um, I mean, uh, gray area, is that my call? And I, uh, in love, will let, because I'm not the Holy Spirit, I will let God do His work in an individual. It's not my place to say whether you should or should not love this or that or this person or this political view. That, that's not up to me. Uh, if you ask my opinion, I'll tell you. But is that even worth it? Is my opinion worth anything? When it comes to the scriptures, I try to make sure that you know that this isn't my opinion. That's probably why you're here this morning, because... This has value to you. And when you open it up and you say, I wonder what that means, 
Maybe Wayne will tell us. Wayne will work at it. I don't have the right to give you my opinion about God's work. So we are going to conclude today, uh, and that's why some of you with the, the sheets have text A and text B, verses 7 and 8, and then verses 9, 10, and 11. Believe me, there is a lot here. And, the, the, uh, and it goes, there's a lot more to come. Uh, but to finish up in verse 8, the last thing there, and I probably will just have time to mention it because it, it needs some time, is because the reason that we do that with one another and we are, we are fully exerted in our commitment to one another on the basis of what we all need, not what we deserve. You know, and I could say, um, whoever, whatever, anything that's opposite of the cups. I could say, Dodgers forever. And, and some of you might want to do this. You can't do that. You can't do that. You don't have that option as a follower of Jesus Christ. You don't. Love, it says, covers a multitude of sins. And that doesn't mean that we bury our differences. It doesn't. I am different than you. And just for the sake of argument, Dodgers forever. There you go. you got to love me anyway. you got to love me anyway. It doesn't mean that we bury. It doesn't even mean, in a sense, because this isn't really what it's talking about, forgiving. It's a matter that I look across the room and I see you, and I know you're different than me. I know you're, and, and name it, I, I don't care, whatever category. This is different, and, and, and I'm different. What do both of us need? We need the commitment to one another through Jesus Christ, that in spite of all, what you need is me as your brother. To stand with you in the name of Jesus Christ. And what I need from you, when I look to the left and to the right, and whatever kind of hat you're wearing, it's not the same as mine, I look and we look at each other and say, because of Jesus Christ, I'm standing with you. That's what the church needs. That's the strength of the church through Jesus Christ. That's where we need to go. Everything else must fall away from that. You can see how this portion here, and we're, we're, we're not even halfway done with this portion. This portion is powerful, and it doesn't stop there. It's like Peter took a break and said, how many great things can I get pack into this? Oh, man, I'm going to just... Verses 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 are powerful for the church, powerful for us. We need it. We must live here. We must live here. So I'm sure we took a poll. None of you would have an issue with keeping Jesus Christ in the center. I mean, I'd, I'd be 100% I'd be confident. None of you would have an issue with that. The loving one another... Unfortunately, I'd have to say I'm 99.9% .9 sure. <laughs> because we're just people, and we're on a journey. So let's get there together. Father, you are good all the time. You're sovereign. You're God. We're your kids. We need to obey you on this. Help us, Lord. Help this church, everyone who comes under the power of the preaching of your word, to love one another, fully extended, fully exerted, for Christ's sake. And we pray in his name. Amen. Amen.